weil wir gute Freunde haben. Berlin, August 16, 1961. The speaker is Mayor Willie Brandt. He is speaking about the communist barricade that now encircles West Berlin. Nikita Khrushchev, he built the barricade. This program is about why Khrushchev did it and how he did it and the consequences to Germany, to Western Europe and to the free world. For six months, we have lived intimately with the crisis in Berlin, with headlines and news bulletins, with thousands of words printed and spoken. We know a great many facts about this crisis. What is harder to know is what the facts mean, how they fit together. For many Americans, these have been days of confusion and frustration. We're in a fight in which our opponent appears to be using a new kind of tactic. One day he assaults us. The next day he talks total disarmament. Which does he mean? In this hour, we're going to review the events of these last six months, try to put them in perspective. We begin in Czechoslovakia. It is June 1st, 1961. The train is en route from Moscow. Its destination is Vienna. The temper of the world is crisis. Architect of the crisis, Nikita Khrushchev. Our view for the next 60 minutes is over his shoulder. Our purpose is to watch how he operates, how he pulls the strings, orchestrates the elements of a crisis. On June 1st, he is on his way to meet the new president of the United States, embarked on one of the riskiest adventures of his career. As he approaches Vienna, he must calculate what he is up against. This is his view, Europe looking west. The wall of the NATO alliance, land, sea, missile, air bases across Western Europe from Spitsbergen to the Mediterranean. Backing them up, the nuclear weight of the American Strategic Air Command's intercontinental bomber. The American arsenal, Titan, Atlas, and Polaris missiles. He knows he cannot presently match the military power of the West. He knows the West can destroy him in a nuclear war. This is also his view, the economic power of the West, of Europe, of West Germany. As a Marxist, he believes economic power is the means to political power. He knows he cannot match the combined industrial power of Western Europe and the United States. At the heart of Western Europe, he sees West Germany, prosperous, strong, growing stronger. West Germany is committed to the Western alliance. West Berlin, an island of high wages and good living in a gray communist sea. A symbol of Western power and prosperity that the West spends $300 million a year to maintain. To Khrushchev, a bone stuck in his throat. East Germany. The reason Khrushchev must make his move now. He needs East German factories, production, production skills. What he does not need, cannot allow to go on, is the resistance of the East Germans. They do not like communism. They do not like their communist leaders. His failure to bring them into line has weakened his position at home, has opened him to behind-the-scenes attack by the Stalinists, the Chinese communists. The open West Berlin border is a funnel through which three and a half million of the best-trained East Germans have escaped in the last 16 years. 
These things are on his mind as he approaches Vienna. He knows what he is up against. He knows he needs a success to show the Soviet Party Congress in October. He knows the risks he runs in the deadly chess game that is about to begin. June 3rd, Vienna, the Schönbrunn Palace. For a moment, the faded glories of the Habsburg Empire live again. Beneath crystal chandeliers, the state ballet company dances the Blue Danube Waltz, watching the two men who hold the fate of civilization in their hands. The president is somber-faced. The timing of this summit meeting is not of his choosing. He has been in office only five months. He is burdened by the recent American failure in Cuba. He has come to Vienna reluctantly. Khrushchev has forced this meeting. Tensions are increasing, crises threaten. Khrushchev plays on the world's fear of war. The president has said this is not a meeting to negotiate. It is only a test of intentions. He has warned the West not to expect too much. But at this moment, the world watches Vienna, filled with hope, born of longing for peace. And for a night, Vienna is once more the city of waltzes. After, it is 1961 again. The president sees another side of Nikita Khrushchev. For Khrushchev, it is a chance to test the new president, to see how he responds to pressure. On the subject of Berlin, Khrushchev is tough and blunt. He wants recognition of the present Polish-East German border. He wants a peace treaty that recognizes the division of Germany. He wants a neutralized West Berlin. He wants no nuclear arms for West Germany. After two days, the talks end. The president has strongly reaffirmed the Western position. But Khrushchev has made the first move in the chess game. And the president knows it. As he leaves, he says, it's going to be a cold winter. Khrushchev's comments, if he has any, are unrecorded. Stop for a moment. Mr. Chairman, just a question, please. One question. Yeah, here goes everything. Not a word. The president is back in Washington. From the White House, he reports on television to the nation. Good evening, my fellow citizens. I returned this morning from a week-long trip to Europe, and I want to report to you on that trip in full. It was, in every sense, an unforgettable experience. Mr. Khrushchev and I had a very full and frank exchange of views. Our views contrasted sharply, but at least we knew better at the end where we both stood. The president also knows now where he stands with his allies. The day before Vienna, he was in Paris. He and General de Gaulle discussed the Berlin crisis. The two men were said to be impressed with each other on their first meeting. Publicly, the president appeared in complete agreement with de Gaulle. John Rich, NBC Paris. President de Gaulle's approach to the Berlin crisis had not changed since the crisis erupted in 1958. His attitude was that the Western allies were there by right of conquest. If the Soviets wanted to push us out, then that meant war. The day after Vienna, the president was welcomed in London. The British assured him that Khrushchev would make no move in Berlin until after the West German elections in September. Publicly, he and Prime Minister Macmillan were in complete agreement. But Khrushchev knows the president cannot agree with both the French and the British.
The British were in no mood at that time to be tough with the Russians about anything, particularly about Berlin. Their empire was disappearing. South Africa had just left the Commonwealth. Their trade figures were badly down, and the pound sterling was in deep trouble. The president was asking them at such a time to risk their fragile economy to German competition in the common market and their lives and their very survival as a nation for Germans in Berlin. The British still remembered Germans as Hitler's pilots, smashing and burning their cities during the last war. The British were not ready in June to die for West Berlin. There are even some in Britain, as Khrushchev knows, who feel that his rockets are less a menace to their survival than the Scottish-based American Polaris submarines. Khrushchev calls the Americans warmongers. He praises the British as peace-loving. His aim is to drive a wedge between the Allies. On the Polaris dock, the demonstrators sing, you cannot spend a dollar when you're dead. If the authorities are not sympathetic, Khrushchev is. Let's have peace, he says. Let's have general and complete disarmament. But a few days later, he sings a different tune. Moscow, June 21st. It is the 20th anniversary of Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. Khrushchev is speaking. He appears on television wearing his lieutenant general's uniform. He speaks of Berlin. He repeats his demands. He adds a new threat. The German question must be settled by the end of the year. Otherwise, the peace of the world will be threatened. Two weeks later, he gives the screw another turn. He puts on display new secret Soviet warplanes. The air show is piped to all of Europe, described in a half dozen languages. After it is over, Khrushchev finds an occasion to speak to British ambassador Sir Frank Roberts. It would take six of his bombs, Khrushchev says, to wipe Britain off the map. The British government did not tell the British people what Mr. Khrushchev boasted to their ambassador in Moscow, that he could wipe them out with six bombs. The story did leak out by way of Washington, the British press played it down, and there was a reason. In 1957, the government had officially stated that Britain could not be defended against nuclear weapons. The British record for bravery is unchallenged and unchallengeable. But when they allowed themselves to think about nuclear war, they could not help seeing in it the possibility of the final curtain at the end of their thousand-year story. The goal is not frightened by Khrushchev's estimate that he can destroy France with nine bombs. But Khrushchev has reason to doubt that the French people are as immune to his tactics. John Rich, NBC Paris. A newspaper poll showed that seven out of ten Frenchmen felt that Berlin was not worth fighting for. Many Frenchmen agreed with Khrushchev on one point, that Germany should be kept divided. The day that Kennedy arrived in Paris, a treason trial of some of France's most illustrious generals opened. Nobody could be sure where the French army stood, not even de Gaulle. If the British and French had a special view of the Berlin crisis, so did some of the other members of the alliance. Rome, the Kirinale Palace, office of the President of the Republic. In the summer of 1961, war jitters have spread to Italy. Premier Fanfani wants to be known as a peacemaker.
He has gone to Washington, and in his opinion, he has been snubbed. Khrushchev invites him to Moscow. He accepts. Irving R. Levine, NBC, Rome. Premier Amintori Fanfani went to Moscow for several reasons. Besides seeking personal prestige, Fanfani was acting in response to pressures within Italy for neutralism and for greater trade with the Soviet bloc. Italy is enjoying its biggest industrial boom. Understandably, no Italian wants to see this prosperity destroyed in a war, especially a war over Berlin. It was against this background that Premier Fanfani arrived in Moscow, the background that Nikita Khrushchev was well aware of. The red carpet is rolled out. Publicly, Khrushchev speaks of his love of peace. Privately, he tells Fanfani that if there is a war, Italy will be his nuclear hostage. His words have their intended effect. Shortly after arriving home, Fanfani began a correspondence with Nikita Khrushchev to try to arrange negotiations. He also began to try to arrange an understanding with the Socialist Party of Pietro Nenni, until recently an outright ally of the Communists, for Nenni to support a Fanfani Christian Democratic government. Why did Fanfani undertake these domestic and external exercises? Well, some diplomats believe that he was frightened, clear and simple, frightened by Khrushchev's words and attitudes, and that as a result, he is trying to move Italy to what he considers the safer ground of neutralism. In July, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin is on a goodwill tour. To war jittery Western Europe, to London, he brings words of peace and friendship. Through him, Khrushchev speaks softly to the West. If the West is reasonable, of course, there will be no war. As to what is more difficult, the actual flight or the speech making afterwards, it's really very difficult to say. He advises anyone who really wants to make a study of the subject to try a space flight himself and form his own opinion. <laughs> Yuri Gagarin perfectly symbolizes the two faces of Khrushchev's assault. On the one hand, he comes to the West smiling, speaking words of peace. On the other, no one in the West can forget that the rockets that lifted him into orbit can also rain total devastation on their homes. Khrushchev has talked tough, talked soft, played on the world's desire for peace, its fear of war. Looking West, Khrushchev calculates the time has come for him to make his move. August 1961. The crisis in Berlin is coming to a boil. But who is in trouble? Khrushchev or the West? As August begins, the West is not quite sure. In July, 1,000 East Germans escaped into West Berlin every day. Now in August, they are coming out at the rate of 2,500 a day. East Germany is being bled of its best trained people. Talk of revolt grows louder in East Germany as a result of Khrushchev's threats and demands. To the West's way of thinking, Khrushchev has boxed himself in. The Western foreign ministers are meeting in Paris. Their main concern is East Germany. They remember the slaughter that followed the 1953 East German revolt. They remember how they could not help the East Germans then. They don't want the same thing to happen again. They don't want to encourage the East Germans to revolt. The East Germans are Khrushchev's problem. They do not recognize the legal existence of East Germany, but they accept Soviet domination of East Germany as a fact. In their view, the pressure is on Khrushchev, not on the West. They agreed on and laid down a detailed plan for meeting Mr. Khrushchev's threat to sign a peace treaty with the East Germans by the end of the year. The plan went like this. Conrad Adenauer was expected to be re-elected in West Germany on September 17th. A few days following this, the Western foreign ministers would make their first contact with the Soviets through Mr. Gromyko. 
before Gromyko would be dangled the prospect of a foreign minister's meeting. At this foreign minister's meeting, it would be determined whether or not the Soviets were sincere enough to give Mr. Khrushchev his summit meeting. The summit would be proposed for January so that the West would not seem to be negotiating under the year-end deadline. Well, all the pieces fitted together neatly, and it might have worked out, but the Western foreign ministers failed to consider what Mr. Khrushchev might be doing while their elaborate plan was evolving. Khrushchev is not inactive. August 6th, he sends cosmonaut Titov 200 miles into space, orbiting the Earth once every 89 minutes. His course is plotted by radio telescopes. His face is seen on Soviet television 200 miles below. His voice is picked up by shortwave radio. All the world follows the circling capsule, recognizes a triumph for Soviet science, for Soviet prestige, for Soviet power. August 9th, cosmonaut Titov is back in Moscow. Khrushchev uses the occasion to announce that his scientists can build a hundred megaton bomb, that a rocket like the one that carried Titov into space can deliver it. United States disarmament advisor John McCloy describes the meaning of the bomb. Does anyone know what that means? Uh, some of you, as, as I have, have seen the effects of an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, a large city wiped out with its population in the main, either killed, maimed, or doomed. Even that bomb was probably greater than was what was needed to uh, accomplish this destruction on Hiroshima. Can your mind grasp 5,000 times as devastating a blow, which is what a 100 megaton bomb would, bomb would be? Can you imagine what that might be on a highly organized and articulated city? And the answer is, of course, that no one in this room can begin to grasp its dire potentials. Having shocked the world, Khrushchev goes off to Sochi on the Black Sea to his summer retreat. He is reported to be vacationing. He has baited his trap. He picks the moment to close it with great care. Saturday, August 12th, Paris is deserted except for the pigeons and the American tourists. August is the month for vacations in France. All good Englishmen are on holiday. The British are convinced Khrushchev will not do anything drastic until after the West German elections. Nothing to worry about. The temperature in Washington is 86. All government officials who can are taking the weekend off leaving the city to the out-of-town visitors, the sightseers, the families on vacation. The president will spend the weekend in Hyannisport. In Berlin, night has fallen. It's an ordinary Saturday night in August in a city that has lived through 16 years of crisis. In West Berlin, the sounds of the night are sentimental, nostalgic. On this Saturday night, no one is thinking about Nikita Khrushchev. 